Good evening and welcome to the Caltech Y Winter Friends webinar. My name is Agnes Tong. I am the Director of Marketing and Development for the Caltech Y. And we want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We are so happy to have Professor Alice Mang as our speaker tonight. And we have a great program lined up for you this evening. First off, we're going to hear from our student XCOM Vice President of Operation, Elizabeth Gallmeyer. Hi everyone, welcome to this Winter Terms Friends webinar. We are really excited to have you join us this afternoon from wherever you are. So I'm Elizabeth, I am the Caltech Y Student Executive Committee Vice President of Operations, which is a mouthful. Um, I'm a fourth year undergrad and I am studying chemistry and history. So the Y has been an absolutely critical part of my life for these past four years that I've been at Caltech. And I'm really thankful to the Y staff, board members, and my fellow students for making my experience at Caltech so rich and meaningful. I have really had countless opportunities um, to broaden my perspective and in my world, which is something that may not come so easily while, while studying at this this uh, institution. Um, I, I started becoming involved with the Y as a freshman through um, the Y service opportunities. I had been involved in tutoring and service in high school, um, and I was pretty determined to continue um, at Caltech no matter how busy I was. So with the Y, um, I started by teaching um, underprivileged middle school and high school students um, through the Y's off-campus Hathaway Sycamore's tutoring program, which, um, which is held in, in Highland Park. And later, I uh, started working with Kids Reading to Succeed, the Y's uh, very famous RISE tutoring program. And um, now I'm working with Reading Partners of LA. So tutoring and, and teaching local students is something that I really, I really love to do because it gives me perspective beyond just that, that narrow tunnel vision um, that is typical of my usual college student, student life. Um, so besides giving me, uh, I guess, a, a platform to continue engaging in service, the Y has also um, introduced me to science policy and, and broadened my mind in that way as well. Um, the Y's annual DC science policy trip is a, is a real trademark. Um, and that's a, an experience I, I learned about my, my freshman year here at Caltech. So my, my chance to actually get involved in science policy um, came around somewhat, uh, I guess you could say serendipitously uh, during my sophomore year. Um, the then ex-con president had mentioned to me um, that she and some grad students were brainstorming a science policy trip to Geneva, Switzerland. And I was absolutely ecstatic to help with the planning and organizing of the trip. We worked really, really hard to make the trip a success. And half a year later, we were there in Geneva, um, visiting the headquarters of places like the Red Cross, the WHO, CERN, and, and even the UN. Um, and it was really from working with fellow students to organize and lead this global policy trip to Geneva that I learned um, the value of and, and the fun and dedicated work towards a common idea or a common goal. So um, these experiences um, in service and global science policy are just two of many, many examples of the numerous opportunities that I've had because of the why. All of, all of these experiences have shaped my perspective, and it's really because of the why that I can say that I feel uh, maybe more ready, not, not quite ready yet, but more ready to continue my journey um, through life as, as a more responsible citizen of the world. So thank you for letting me share my story with you this afternoon. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Athena who is going to be introducing our speaker. Well, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed hearing Elizabeth's story. 
My name is Athena Castro. I'm the Executive Director of the Caltech Y. And before introducing our speaker this afternoon, I wanted to add my welcome and thank you for not only attending this Friends webinar, but also for supporting the Caltech Y. Support from the Friends is so critical to the Y, but especially meaningful during this pandemic year. In fact, this talk was originally scheduled for May 2020, and we were just beginning to advertise the event when the world changed a year ago. So I'm really pleased that we were able to reschedule and hold this virtual event and include friends far and wide. And if you're an alum and remember going to these friends dinners, welcome back. Ellis, uh, Professor Meng, as you know, graduated from Caltech with both her bachelor's and doctorate degrees. As a faculty member at USC's Viterbi School of Engineering, she is the Offer Nemirovsky Chair in Convergent Biosciences and also serves as the Vice Dean of Technology of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. She has many accomplishments and many awards, too many to name here, so I will highlight just a few. Last September, Ellis was elected Vice President of Technical Activities elect of the IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Science Society. This position has oversight of the technical activities portfolio of the society. And in addition to this latest recognition, Ellis was previously honored by the IEEE Censors Council with their 2019 Technical Achievement Award Mommy. for her contributions in the censors field and her works applications for drug delivery and microfluidics. Got a zoom bomber here. <laughs> microfluidics, neural interfaces, and medical implants. In collaboration with her colleague, Professor Song, Ellis established the Polymer Implantable Electrode, or PI Foundry, a technology resource founded, funded by the National Institutes of Health, which we'll hear more about later during the talk. And along with another Caltech alum, she co-founded a startup called Sensier, which is developing self-aware sensing devices that can vastly improve the, the treatment of hydrocephalitis, a pediatric condition that causes excessive fluid in the brain. Professor Meng has a long history of leadership and her desire to make a difference, which is so evident in her work and volunteer involvements was also apparent while she was a student at Caltech. Ellis was active on the WISE Student Executive Committee while she was an undergrad. The XCOM, as you know, is the group of student leaders charged with planning and coordinating Y programs. I also had the opportunity to work with Ellis on the YES program, which was a residential outreach program for high school students. As a graduate student, Ellis worked with Professor Yu Chong Tai, who unfortunately couldn't attend, but very much wanted to be here to support Ellis. And on top of her academic work, Ellis was, was a much loved graduate RA in Lloyd House. So even as a student, her influence reached beyond academics, and we can see that in her career trajectory. I now turn it over to Professor Ellis Meng. Ellis, thank you for speaking today. Thank you for having me and for that wonderful introduction. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen and hopefully this all goes off very well without any technical issues. Um, okay, hopefully that works and everyone can see my screen now. Um, so I thought I'd start off, and I think Athena already uh, kind of captured a little bit of my, my Caltech journey. And so before I get into the actual topic here, let me kind of just share a little bit of my Caltech history and how I got to, to sort of where I am and in, in the, the work that I do today. All right, so I started back in the fall of uh, 1993 and earned my uh, BS in engineering and applied science. I don't know if that degree exists anymore back in 1997. Uh, while an undergrad, I was a member of Lloyd House for alums. I, this probably still matters, so I'll put that out there. And I also uh, met my husband there, uh, Tan Hong, who's also a Lloydie. Um, as an undergraduate, I was involved um, very much so with the Caltech women's basketball team, which actually started up when I was a sophomore um, at Caltech, and then also got more and more involved with the Caltech Y as the years went on, um, and, and especially um, more so when I became a graduate student. Um, so, uh, as a graduate student, um, I did become a resident associate. It just so happens that there was an opening in Lloyd House. And so I started off as a resident associate in Lloyd House along with my husband. Um, and 
I think we spent maybe a total of seven years doing that. And in that time, we covered for Ricketts House and then also parts of off campus as well. Uh, as Athena mentioned, I did my graduate work with YC Tai, who happens to be a graduate of UC Berkeley. There he studied with uh, Professor Richard Muller, who turns out uh, got his master's and PhD at Caltech. So there's sort of this circular um, <laughs> connection there. And then I started at USC in the summer of 2004, um, shortly after I left Caltech. And while um, uh, since that time, I've actually had the opportunity to interact with a number of Caltech alums. Um, and so some of these you may recognize, Christian Gutierrez, I think was also actually in the YES program. And in fact, I was his mentor when he was an undergraduate for research. And later on, I actually recruited him to be a PhD student in my lab. Uh, Key Shulton did a short postdoc with me and then left for industry and is now the director of the Pi Foundry, which you'll hear about earlier. Uh, and Alice Liu, who I was an RA for for a short period of time, um, actually is now working as staff at USC. Um, and I interact with her daily in my sort of vice dean role. She's actually the assistant director of our program. So there are Caltech connections everywhere um, in my past and in my, my daily uh, work. All right, so I'm gonna go back now and talk about the, the topic um, of the webinar today and to kind of give you a sense of why this area of um, you know, electrodes in the brain is important. I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about how it's used in the context of uh, medicine and healthcare today. Um, so fundamentally, um, we understand that electricity is integral in the way that the nervous system works. In fact, much of the communication that happens um, is, is uh, in, elect in the form of electrical signals. And so what that means to us as, uh, say, engineers, is that these electrical signals can then be manipulated or fed back into the system to actually control what the body is doing. And the purpose of doing that is to um, basically provide a useful and meaningful clinical outcome for a patient. Um, this strategy is becoming more and more popular uh, because the sort of past paradigm where pharmaceuticals have ruled medicine and healthcare may not be applicable in certain disease states, right? So certain indications uh, may not benefit from pharma pharmaceuticals because they just don't exist or they're just not effective or they're associated with uh, very nasty side effects um, that we really wanna avoid. Uh, and so um, the, the two ways in which we can manipulate the nervous system with electricity is either directly or indirectly. Um, and what can we actually treat um, via this route? It turns out there's a whole lot that is being explored. A lot of this is still in its infancy. Um, and you'll start to see a lot of, of uh, terms associated with this field of using electricity to interface with the body. So you may have heard of words like neuroprosthetics, bioelectronic medicine is very popular these days. Neuromodulation, biostimulation, electroceuticals, there's a whole range of them. And they, they kind of overlap. In some cases, they mean the same thing. In other cases, not. It really depends on who you talk to. Um, but they all involve typically some electricity uh, that interfaces with the body. Um, so there's this huge potential as far as medicine and healthcare to impact lots of patients. If you look at the set of disease states, it affects you know, millions of people world, uh, worldwide. Um, and you know, there's also a tremendous um, opportunity uh, market-wise. Um, all right, looks like my si slides are coming through a bit fuzzy, so I apologize for that. It could be just the, um, the internet. Let me, let me try something really quick and I will come right back. So let me stop sharing. <laughs> and reshare. I have this problem sometimes when I teach. So let me, let me try something really quick. And see if I can fix that. This is the same setup that I use to teach. <laughs> and sometimes it gives me, uh, gives me problems with uh, output. I had my students complain about this as well. So I'm gonna try to switch my, my screen up a little bit and see if we can resolve some of these problems.
All right, let me reshare now. All right, so hopefully that is maybe a little bit better, maybe not. Um, so the, there's, there's tremendous interest by industry uh, to try to push the boundaries of this technology forward uh, for the benefit of patients. Uh, and so critical to this is really the introduction of new engineering approaches um, to enable you know, new technologies and devices right, that can address these different conditions. So, so this is sort of the, um, the hope, the end goal. And prior to being able to do that, however, there are some barriers. And, and part of the barrier is actually where we are um, as far as our state of knowledge. How, how can we actually meaningful inter meaningfully interact with the nervous system to affect something that's meaningful for patients? And so here comes uh, science. So the National Academies of Engineering uh, recognized in 2008 that it's uh, really a priority to really understand how the brain works and reverse engineer the brain. And then the uh, federal government followed suit and recognized that there really needed to be more resources poured into this area. And so in 2013, the uh, Brain Initiative was announced and sort of since that time, there have been a number of other initiatives announced worldwide by different countries. So uh, then uh, President Obama that announced this initiative basically made the remark that, you know, we really don't understand how the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears works. And so from that point on, we launched, um, you know, a, um, a whole, um, a bunch of research dedicated towards unlocking the secrets of the brain. And so what I want to illustrate very quickly to, to give you a sense of why this is so complex is to give you a really you know, quick 30 second crash course in neuroscience. And so um, th probably there are some of you out there in the audience that know this stuff better than I do. I have actually never taken a neuroscience class before. So I'll try to distill it in a way that can be understand by um, you know, the, the general audience here. So the brain is incredibly complex. And part of the reason for that complexity is the fact that it spans so many different uh, length scale. So if you look at that uh, chart on the left-hand side, where you look at sort of the, the central nervous system or CNS, uh, which captures the brain spinal and, and spinal cord, that's on the length scale of one meter. But if you go all the way down to the level of molecules, now you're talking about one angstrom. So just within the span of length scales, we have an incredible amount of complexity. Um, so if we take the brain and we start to break it up, you know, you can, you can identify uh, different circuits and then you can even go more granular and start to look at the individual units that, that sit within the brain. So um, individual units that do the processing, their neurons are roughly about 20 microns in diameter. Each neuron can make about a thousand connection, uh, connections with its neighbors. So if you do the math, that's about 10 to the 14 connections. And these connections uh, measure you know, 20 to 40 nanometers wide. So that they occur at um, items known as synapses. Right, so this scale is really quite difficult to manage. And on top of that, right, the brain not only consists of neurons, but there's a whole bunch of other um, support cells in there. There's 50% um, support cells, which are not fully unlocked as far as exactly what it is that they do and the role that they play. All right, so information transfer ultimately happens at these synapses. And I mentioned that this is on the nanometer scale. They're about 20 to 40 nanometer wide. Well, the, the most common type is. And the way this communication happens is, a, is via molecules. So they pass uh, molecules known as neurotransmitter, of which there are about 100 different kinds or so. And they can either turn things on or turn things off. They can be inhibitory or excitatory. Um, there are also, um, I think, less prevalent types of uh, synapses called electrical uh, ones as well. But uh, we'll kind of ignore those for the time being. All right. So, if I look at the fundamental unit, the neuron, and it turns out that I can, if I had the right kind of electrode uh, and I were to make the right kind of interface with that um, neuron at some point uh, on, its, um, on that, that uh, unit, then I could measure something called a membrane potential. And this is sort of the fundamental characteristic activity, electrical activity that's associated with a neuron. You, know, you can see that it has a certain amplitude, it has a certain time span, uh, to it. And the reason this can happen is because the neuron itself is permeable and, it, and ions can move in and out of it. And so it gives this characteristic membrane potential and time signature. All right. So hopefully with this really quick crash course, um, you understand that what we're after uh, to understand what's going on in the brain are looking at these uh, nerve action potentials, right? So we want to see 
what is going on there. Uh, and we can also affect these by applying an electric field and perturbing um, the system. And so what this ultimately means is that we have the ability to manipulate our nervous system uh, by stimulating, or on the other hand, we can just sit um, aside and basically peer into what's happening, eavesdrop on what's going on. Uh, this is not only true of the brain, but sort of of the broader nervous system as well. Um, as far as where the field is going with this, there are many ways in which we can actually get at this information. Um, sort of the, the holy grail is to get an interface technology that can be bi-directional, so it can do essentially both recording and stimulation. That turns out to be technologically quite difficult to do for a number of reasons, and so this is still, still an area of very active research. Um, and so typically what people will do is focus either on recording or stimulation. So uh, we'll look uh, a little bit at what this means as far as where we are in the current state of the art. Most of the, mo uh, of the maturest interfaces happen to use electricity as a means of communication. Uh, at the very end, I'll mention that there's also an effort to try to move away from electricity because electricity has its sort of advantages and disadvantages. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's very critical that new technologies are introduced to allow us to be able to study the nervous system better. And this was you know, a, a point that has been known for quite some time. Here's a quote taken from a Nobel laureate from 1932. The history of electrophysiology that is recording signals uh, in the nervous system has been decided by the history uh, essentially of development of electrical recording instruments. And so let's take a, a very brief look in history at exactly um, uh, what has gone on as far as recording tools. So uh, very early on, many of the, the experiments that were done uh, were, were done in animal. And so here's a, a tool on the left-hand side of galvanometer. Um, this was developed roughly in the uh, early 1800s in which you could measure an, the amplitude of an action potential. So this tool was sensitive enough to, to measure uh, changes in voltage. The challenge, however, was that this tool was not fast enough to actually record um, an action potential. Uh, it wasn't until 1868 that the rheotome was invented um, to be able to resolve a single action potential. And the image on the bottom right is actually a graph taken um, of this first action potential that was recorded. So since that time, electronics has progressed very, very rapidly. Um, the other piece that we need to be able to record is the interface with the body, the electrode that sits in contact with the body in some way to pick up signals. It turns out, although I mentioned the action potential earlier, you can actually interface with the body in many ways and record from many different locations. So there are non-invasive interfaces that can sit on say the outside um, of the skull, it doesn't breach the skin in any way. You may have to shave off some hair to get good contact with the skin. This is known as an electroencephalogram. Some of you may have experienced this. Um, the challenge with this is you get lots of um, information, but it's not well resolved. So you can't get down to what is happening at the level of a single cell. And so there really isn't a good way of getting at what's happening at a single cell without sort of breaching the skull in some way. And so then you can start to get into invasive um, uh, implants. And the most sensitive kind is actually intracellular. So you're now at the level of a cell um, you have an interface that's established with a cell that is unfortunately destructive to get at the intracellular space. And in that case, one can actually record um, an intracellular action potential. And so that's the, the information hopefully you can see with my uh, mouse here. Um, it turns out this is not practical if you wanna to listen to a large number of neurons uh, and it you know, takes graduate students a lot of time to learn this technique. Uh, a more practical way of getting at this information although with, with some disadvantages is actually to you know, stick an electrode close enough to a cell that you can kind of listen in on what's happening. And so this is known as the uh, extracellular action potential that you can record. Depending on how you size this electrode, you can get at information that's happening um, at a single neuron, or you can get at information that's happening in groups of neurons. So single unit and multi-unit kind of illustrated uh, down below. All right, so what enables this? So it turns out there's been decades of development of more and more sophisticated invasive um, electrodes that can be implanted into the brain, whether it is for, the, for research use or for clinical use. And so if you look uh, in the 1950s, um, the best that we had at that point in time was to take tiny metal wires, insulate them 
all along the length and only expose a tiny recording area at the very, very tip. Uh, these devices are still used today and they can actually be arrayed. Uh, there's an image here showing an array of these electrodes um, uh, in the upper and middle section here. Uh, and so, you know, they can be made um, in these, you know, somewhat sophisticated, uh, largely manually assembled bundles. And so you can get at, you know, maybe hundreds of neurons in this way. Uh, in the 19, uh, mid 1970s, there was something known as a patch camp that came along that allowed higher resolution uh, recordings because it, you, know, you can get at intracellular uh, action potentials. Um, challenge, as I mentioned before, with this is that you really can't um, do this at scale. So you can't really apply this to many neurons at the same time because you have to do a, a hunting and searching um, process to be able to mate the tip of the glass pipe pit to a neuron. Um, during this, this time span, the uh, microelectronics in, uh, uh, industry was really developing quite rapidly. And along with it, the technology to be able to control the dimensions and features of very small um, objects, right? And so by applying some of the technologies used to build transistors um, in the 70s to so this problem of how do we actually get at many, many neurons, um, the whole realm of silicon-based microelectrodes uh, was, was born. And so these were introduced in the 1970s, and there were two basic approaches um, um, here that were taken. The first one very much resembles microwires. You, um, so what you could do is you could take a chunk of silicon, you can carve out these very sharp tips, and essentially treat the silicon such that it's actually conductive, and the tip is, um, um, you know, you typically apply a different kind of metal at the tip to get good recording quality, and the rest of the length is now uh, insulated. And so you can make um, devices that look very much like these arrays of microwires, but now all in silicon, so it does not have to be handmade. These are automated. They can be um, manufactured, you know, hundreds at a time um, in a, a very nice manner. So this is one approach. The other approach that uh, groups took was, um, you know, taking advantage of the planar nature in which transistors are made, sort of by putting down materials one layer at a time. Um, the other strategy was to take this long slender needle, this the shank as many uh, people in the field call it, and instead actually put different electrode sites all along the length. And so you're really using the volume um, that is swept by the needle going into the brain in a much more efficient way, way by actually having electrodes that can pick up signals at different depths along the length of that shank. And so these uh, technologies that were developed in the 70s have kind of stuck around in many technologies or many variants of them uh, now exist today. Uh, and we're now at the state where roughly, you know, every seven years or so, we can double the number of neurons we can record from. And so this is kind of captured in a Moore's law-like graph in the upper uh, left-hand uh, corner. Um, more sophisticated devices today are not just the electrodes by themselves, but they also combine the power of microelectronics by adding in transistors and other circuitry uh, so that much more can be done. Uh, signals that are recorded can be pro processed locally before moving on to some external system. All right, so now this brings me to, you know, wh what are we trying to do here? So in, in the context of the brain initiative and also in the context of trying to advance this overall field using engineering approaches. So it's important to actually take into account what neuroscientists want. And uh, they're very interested in, you know, a whole lot of things. In fact, their wish list is very long. And so here I've tried to distill it <laughs> into just a, a list of four different items. Um, they want to be able to listen in not only in one small brain region, but actually to understand what's happening in multiple brain regions. And they need this information in order to, to really truly dissect and understand function. It's very, very difficult to do if they can't access more brain volume. They wanna be able to listen not only to a single neuron, but large groups of neurons. Um, and on different time scales. Some uh, scientists may only care about what happens um, on the order of seconds and others want to find out what is going on in terms of activity over years and years of time. Um, and we have to do so all while uh, perturbing the system in the most minimal way with the least amount of damage. And what that boils down to is there are many challenges that engineers are left to actually solve, right? So, how do we deal with uh, th this issue of scale, both length and time scale? Length from the perspective that the brain is a very complex organ. It has 
different layers and different you know, sort of sub-anatomical structures that we may want to target. We may be interested in looking at information on the surface and also deeper. We can do surface with technology that's sort of available now. Deeper is much more difficult. How do we resolve this issue of devices that last for say the lifetime of a patient? We can't really do that well today. Um, and so have high quality data uh, over long time spans, that's, that's a, a holy grail, a, a difficult challenge to overcome. Um, designing devices can't be done without thinking about the surgery uh, that's entailed to be able to place it properly. And so that has to be a consideration that is taken into account um, up front. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll point out is, is packaging. And that's sort of a, a vague word if you're not sort of familiar with the area. Um, this area is actually given the least amount of attention, but is the, the piece that frequently breaks and causes the most grief and, and really limits um, being able to achieve the length and time scale requirements as well as uh, doing the surgical implant, uh, implantation appropriately. And so well, I'm hoping that eventually this will get the attention that it needs um, and the right amount of research to push it forward as well. So um, there are many challenges that face uh, meeting all of these requirements and giving neuroscientists what they want. Uh, many, many mechanisms of failure that can occur. Um, some of these are associated with a device itself failing, and that can occur from a number of different um, perspectives that can even occur while uh, um, in use. So even if you take care of everything bad that can happen to a device, one challenge is that once a device goes into the body, the interface between the tissue and the device is very complex. And there are a number of, of scientific issues on the exact biological processes that are happening at this interface that actually, um, I think, hold the keys to being able to successfully meet all the requirements I mentioned previously. This is a very tough problem that um, the research field is still trying to tease apart, um, often with uh, imperfect tools. Right? And so one of the, the issues that I'll sort of highlight is that once you place a device into the brain, and there's a lot uh, going on in the slides, very, very busy. Um, so hopefully I can draw your attention to the bottom left. There is a pink device that looks like a pin that is placed into the brain. What you'd like to be able to do is record from the neurons in the vicinity. So these little dots that are circled and blue are neurons. And if the neurons are relatively close to the, to the electrode, say within, you know, five, uh, say within 50 to 100 microns or so, you can actually record from that. The challenge is that the introduction of the device actually produces a controlled injury and the body um, mounts an immune response to this foreign object that's placed in the brain and actually builds up a scar, much like you would if you had a scratch on your, on your arm. Uh, and this scar um, creates a whole number of different problems and actually can push the neurons that we want to record from uh, away. Um, and the initial implant itself may actually cause some neuronal death. And so um, if a probe is implanted and the scar develops and maybe the neurons nearby uh, essentially die off, there's nothing to record from. And so this device is essentially useless um, in the body. So how do we go about fixing this problem? A number of different solutions have been um, uh, proposed. Many different variants of it have been um, investigated. Uh, one of the movements I would say in the research field is a growing recognition that a lot of the stiff materials that we like because they have great um, engineering, engineering material qualities are actually not great in, do not make great interfaces with the body. So silicon, for instance, is quite stiff. And if you put that in the body, um, the brain is very, very soft. There tends to be this uh, large mismatch mechanically between the stiffness of the brain and the stiffness of, of the probe. Uh, the brain is not a static tissue. It's, uh, um, there's uh, um, cardiac cycles that, that influence um, and create micro motion um, that then can agitate the interface between the implant and the brain um, and cause additional immune response uh, to, to mount. Um, and that then exacerbates the scar that forms and essentially cuts short our ability to record. And so these two images in the upper right-hand side um, are there to, to capture uh, what's going on. If you put a very stiff material into the brain, you elicit this very sort of nasty immune response that forms a very large scar. And on the right-hand side, if you swap that material out with something that's softer and closer uh, in stiffness to the brain, it turns out you actually generate a lot less of this. And, the, and essentially the tissue nearby the device is happier 
And so you can record from that because there are healthy neurons nearby. Uh, and so this, this chart here tries to capture um, sort of very crudely what this means, right? So on the top are different devices that have been made using different types of materials. Uh, the numbers you see below with, uh, are the, um, uh, the stiffness, right? It's the Young's modulus of the material. And as you move from very stiff materials like tungsten and silicon to polymers like polyimide, perylene, and silicone, you can um, you know, gain a factor of about 100 or more um, improvement as far as the softness of the material. Um, if you look down below at the boxes that are in green, um, you'll note that if you go all the way to the far bottom right, spinal cord and brain are kind of the worst case scenarios. These are very, very soft tissue. So no matter what you do, as far as the material you pick, you're never really gonna be able to have a one-to-one -one, uh, stiffness ratio. There's always gonna be some sort of mismatch. And so there's, um, but you know, uh, for making devices, um, this is kind of the trade-off that we have to, to deal with and manage. All right, so let me talk a little bit about um, an example of some of our work and um, also transition to talk about the, the Pi Foundry that Athena mentioned earlier. So um, we started, I started working on uh, invasive um, brain interfaces probably at 2010 or so. Uh, and this work actually is a little bit more recent. This one started maybe uh, about 2016 or so. And this is a collaboration with uh, Professor Dong Song, who you see in the, in the lower right. Uh, and Dong's group, what they're interested in is studying the hippocampus, which is an important part of the brain that's involved in the formation of long-term memory. It's also associated with spatial memory, right? So remember, for, for, which is important for navigation. Uh, the hippocampus, it turns out, is a deeper brain structure that sits quite a ways below the surface of the brain. The images that you see on the top are images of a rat brain. This is their model of choice for studying the hippocampus. Um, the fundamental reason why uh, Dong Song is interested in hippocampus is he's interested in producing prostheses that help with memory. And so in the hippocampus, there's this well-studied trisynaptic circuit which essentially shuttles information along in different regions of the hippocampus to help with the formation of memories. And what they, they do here is they look at recording information from one part of the circuit and figuring out using modeling what input they have to provide back into um, say from say DG to CA1 in, the, in this image up here, how do you actually provide, say, let's say CA3 is damaged Right, so how do you bridge this damaged area by recording information from here and then fitting information back elsewhere? And they do this off um, outside of the device, taking the information, processing it with their algorithms and then feeding some stimulation pattern back in to help with memory formation. One of their biggest challenges is getting access to this brain structure and also getting enough information. You know, Dong wants to record as much information as possible. Their tool of choice um, until we started working together is this device down here. This is a micro wired based device I showed you earlier where there are uh, arrays of wires all insulated except at the very tip. So they can only record from the very tip. This device, it's a little bit hard to see but there's actually two rows of electrodes that are staggered. So the back end back here looks a little bit bolder because there's actually two, um, two stacks of electrodes there. And there are two different depths because they're trying to record from different parts of the hippocampus. So this is what they use. In practice, it's actually very difficult surgically to, to place this properly. You have very little room for error because the, the recording um, location is only at the tip of these wires. And so this is a substantial difficulty for um, the graduate students in his lab to place these devices correctly and to get the information that they want out. All right, and so what we, um, did initially with uh, his group was we designed a better set of uh, microelectrodes that uh, where we took into account the exact anatomical layout uh, of the rat hippocampus and design our devices to be uh, to be conformal and so um, like I said what we mean by conformal is that the electrodes aren't sort of randomly or just arbitrarily arranged in a square grid format uh, but actually they're placed very intentionally to match the cell body layers uh, and the layers of interest uh, in the hippocampus, the CA1 and CA3. We actually designed two different kinds to, to look at different parts of the, the hippocampus, but here's the one for CA1 and CA3. 
So um, we took the 16 electrode array that they previously had and essentially gave them four electrodes at each uh, position instead of, instead of one uh, and went from uh, 16 to 64. So this is not a lot, um, but we had to start somewhere. Um, and we're ultimately limited in terms of the 64 recording sites by the instrumentation that he had available in his lab. So this is what they look like um, after they're made. Um, the way my lab works is we do all the designs. The graduate students start from um, you know, sketches on the back of uh, a napkin and then um, translate that into computer um, um, files and then make them um, in the uh, microfabrication clean room at USC. So the materials that we use here um, are known as perylene C, which is a polymer, a biocompatible polymer and platinum. Um, so let me just talk briefly about how we make these in case you're, you're not familiar. As I mentioned, we actually use a layer by layer process and we're swapping out now the silicon backbone of the devices I showed you previously now with a polymer where that is much, much softer. It's a hundred times less stiff. We still use silicon, but the silic silicon is really only there as a tray to support what we're doing on top of it. It's a very flat, uh, nice controlled surface. We put down, um, I should back up for a second. In my field, what we do is we actually talk in cross-sectional drawings. So if you look um, on the upper right, this is what the devices look like if you're looking top down. But if I were to take a knife and cut through them and look at the cross-section, I would see um, slices like this. And so these are actually steps that kind of summarize in the middle the process that we go through. This uh, light gray material is perylene. We put perylene down um, in a vapor uh, process um, that's done in a vacuum. And then we actually use a specialized process to put down the platinum um, and also limit the platinum to be in certain areas. And then we go over top and add another layer of insulative uh, perylene. And we chop out the areas where we want um, the electrodes to be exposed to be able to record from the brain. And also we um, add areas on the side where we chop out the overall device and they're able to essentially peel it away from um, the substrate. So uh, in a nutshell, that's how we actually build these up. And so once we have these, we have to connect them uh, to be useful to a recording setup. Uh, and so we're using the standard um, in-house available tools um, that, are, that have been used for, in, with, along with those other wire-based electrodes. Um, and then we also have to develop uh, custom packaging to allow us to be able to connect to the in-house um, recording system. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. I'm only going to spend this like short second on it. Um, and instead, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what you do once you have these very soft floppy arrays. It turns out that implanting them is not as easy as one might think. And we have to pay some attention to that. So mechanically, these very um, slender whiskers, if you will, um, if I were to try to insert them end on into something that resembles the stiffness of the brain, uh, it turns out that they're gonna experience a mechanical phenomena known as buckling, which you can see. So normally what I'd like to see is I like to see a very straight shank that's actually penetrating this sort of gelatin material at the bottom. Instead of what's happening is that this material is bending, it's exhibiting buckling, and it's really not going anywhere. It's gonna to continue to form and essentially get crushed as I try to advance it. So this is not, this is not helpful. Um, and so instead what we can do, uh, all right, so slides are still fuzzy. I'm, I'm not sure if I can change anything. It's probably just the limit of my um, internet connection here. So sorry about that. Um, so hopefully we'll try to get through these. I also have a video coming up, so I'm not sure if this is gonna play. So we'll, we'll just try our best here. Um, all right, so if we wanna avoid buckling, what we do is we look at this equation. I have to put in one equation here. Um, and, and what this means is that if I have a long slender whisker, it has a certain length, it has a certain width, that has a certain thickness. The mechanical uh, property or the, 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 um, the, the material I'm not changing. So this E here is a function of the mechanical, uh, of, the, of the identity of that material then what I can do to raise the buckling force is to increase the cross-sectional dimensions of the device in some way. And there are others that have actually tried this, it, it works. The challenge with this approach and why I try to avoid it is, is that you essentially create a larger wound in the brain when you try to put these in and it really negates the advantage of building a teeny tiny device to begin with. So I wanna to try to avoid this. So the other more non-intuitive way of dealing with this buckling 
um, issue is actually to look at the denominator of the equation and think about how we can shorten the length to effectively improve the stiffness, right? And so that's captured in this uh, animation in the upper right-hand corner, which I'm not sure is playing uh, given my, my poor bandwidth. Um, we do this by basically embedding about half the length or more of the back end of the probe using a biodegradable polymer known as polyethylene glycol. It dissolves in, in water or saline and only expose a short length of it. If you shorten the length, you essentially improve the stiffness and you can actually uh, put these devices in the brain. And so on the bottom, I'm gonna try to play a video that may or may not show um, of some of these devices being uh, placed into a jar of um, agarose gel, which is at 0.5% and mimics the properties of the brain. And you'll notice that as it's going in, it goes in very easily. It's completely bare. There's nothing else laminated onto it to stiffen it up. And then we go in there and we drop um, some saline and wait for the polyethylene glycol to dissolve. And we implant the rest of the way. In practice during surgery, this only takes you know, a few minutes max. Um, and so we're not adding a substantial amount of time. I see that my video has decided to freeze up. So sorry, this is not working um, out so well. All right. Well, I'll try it a second time to see if it plays. All right, so now it's being dissolved. All right, so it, it, it stopped before getting to the end. So you'll have to believe me that we can go the way. I'm not actually gonna show you um, any images of surgery, um, just as there may be more sensitive members of the audience. Um, happy to, to, to point you to our work in papers where all that material is captured, um, just feel free to reach out to me after the talk. All right, so uh, this, in fact, these devices work. Um, we've been recording with these devices for several years now. Um, and th this kind of captures, this is also a very busy slide, some of what we can do, some of the different types of signals that we can get. Um, and also in the right hand side, the, the more colorful images and, and these images with what look like scribbles and dots are actually the result of um, animal experiments where we're looking at the spatial memory uh, feature, um, looking at particular type of cells known as place cells um, that light up essentially when the rats go to a certain place within this open circular field. Um, so this has actually unlocked a lot of a capability for my collaborator. Um, but 64 electrodes um, is not quite enough. So I'll, I'll get to how we scale up. Um, but before that, I do want to say that um, with uh, this work um, shown on the right-hand side in the slide and also with other work, um, I mentioned earlier that long-term recordings are difficult. It turns out we've been able to record for a year using different kinds of devices that we've made using these soft polymers. And this is unusual because in most um, cases, a lot of these devices start to go, um, I would say silicon-based devices, start to go bad within weeks to months. And so um, I'm feeling that in two separate instances, it is possible to get your long recordings or more. And in both of these, I think the experiments were essentially terminated because we, we couldn't go on any longer, not because the devices um, gave out. So how do we move then from 64 um, to thousands of electrodes? This is really the goal, um, or even more electrodes. How do we build a roadmap for that? If you look at what's been done in the microwire um, arena, whether it's with silicon microwires or metal microwires, they have to tediously on the back end wire up each electrode one at a time using a very manual process. So there are this, there's this large bundle of wires. It's actually hidden in the upper image, but you can kind of see it down here that turn, it's very thick and very rigid. That's then coupled to some uh, connector at the end. Uh, that allows connection to recording instrumentation. Um, this is very tedious and not really scalable as these connectors are not really available in larger uh, channel counts or larger numbers of, to accommodate larger numbers of electrodes. Um, really the, the more practical approach is to move beyond manual assembly and think about incorporating electronics. So if you have silicon-based silicon devices, you can essentially put um, circuitry on the back end right, and take care of minimizing the um, wires coming out by sharing time, by kind of um, selecting through the different electrodes and recording from them one at a time, because it turns out you don't need to listen to all of them at once. 
And so there are many different strategies that, that uh, have been developed that are silicon based. And so you can essentially put the electrode arrays uh, on the same substrate as the, on the same silicon as the electronics or do some sort of integration where you take one piece and, and then sort of um, bond them together. That's a possibility. And this has been done successfully and you can get up to you know, thousands of electrodes with this approach. And the, the device on the far right is kind of showing you the Cadillac device uh, that's out there. Um, this is known as the NeuroPixels device. And they have, I think, you know, close to a thousand sites packed along a very long one centimeter long shank. And all of the information is really handled very nicely by a custom integrated circuit um, on the back end. And so that, that manages the channel count a little bit better. With polymers, we're a little bit out of luck um, because now what we have to do is essentially bring the silicon, which is really the substrate of choice for building um, transistors to the polymer. And so we embarked on this effort to try to find a way to integrate the silicon and the electronics into the back end of our devices and to deal with um, the um, uh, reducing the channel count by sharing time um, with our, our, our traces so that we only read out a couple of electrodes at a time. And the concept was to take what we originally developed, increase the uh, number of electrodes that we could pack in by actually taking advantage of both the top side and the back side um, of our devices, and then to array them so that we can get to thousands of sites. And so this is a project that's actually still in progress. I'll just very briefly mention a couple things that we're, that we're doing and um, try to wrap it up because we're probably getting close to the end of time here. So we did successfully achieve um, devices that have now 512 electrodes that are spread across the front and back side of the device. We've done some simple integration with integrated circuits where we basically take chips and um, paste them into the back side of our um, ribbon cables leading from our electrodes out to recording instrumentation. And then we're also working on understanding what it means uh, to try to surgically implant large arrays of, of such uh, devices all at the same time. And then I'll just mention, um, I, there's a, another Caltech connection here. The circuit that you see here is actually designed by um, my colleague's lab, Hossein Hashemi. Hossein and I were actually in the same building at the same time doing our PhDs in electrical engineering at the same time, but I actually never saw him. Um, he was up, I think, on the fourth floor, uh, and only I heard about him from my office mate as they used to play poker together. But um, I now know Hossein uh, very well. We've been collaborating for a number of years now. All right, so let me talk a little bit about what's next and wrap up in the next uh, two minutes or so. Uh, so we have some time for questions. Um, the project that I mentioned at the end is still ongoing. Uh, we are interested not only in greater complexity to allow more uh, electrodes, but also how do we reach um, different targets and different species, right? So we can reach the hippocampus in rats, but it turns out we can't use that device in other models, right? It's certainly not gonna get there in human um, or more large animal models. And then and another goal that we um, have long wanted to do is to share devices with the community. I've had many different researchers approach me over the years and say, can you help us make this for you know, this one experiment? And you know, we've never really had the capacity to do that um, until now. I think so the, the brain initiative, what it enabled um, or these technology resource uh, resources. Uh, and so we were, um, Dong and I applied and were able to successfully win a resource center through the brain initiative that allows us to provide devices to the broader neuroscience community. Um, it's run by multiple staff. In fact, he that I mentioned very early on in the second slide is the director of this foundry. And this is actually a great deal for researchers. They can come to us, we can build devices that they design or that we design for them and essentially do it for free. That's um, you know, one of our many services. We also offer training on how to use them. Um, we also will do testing. If someone has another device that they have and they want us to do testing, we offer standardized testing. Uh, and, and really the point here is that you know, we really wanna make these, these better tools available so that they're not uh, orphaned in laboratories or in papers, uh, journal papers, and leave people to try to reproduce our results on their own. Um, the stuff that you've seen here uh, today really took years of development. We struggled through many different obstacles that I really don't wish upon anyone. And so we're trying to standardize the processes and democratize access to these arrays by the broader community. And so, you know, this is just some of um, the information that we typically give. It's, we use very standard um, formats here. Um, and then um, these are some devices that are already ready that we produced. 
that if someone does not want to actually design their own can actually request from us. So uh, let, me, let me kind of wrap up here and take it back to the very beginning. You know, the reason that we're doing this is that really we have to unlock more of the mysteries of the brain to address the neurological uh, diseases that are out there. There's 7% of the global disease burden and many of the treatment options can involve electrodes and tissue. Um, and to get at devices that are gonna work, um, there are many, many problems that we have to solve. Um, unfortunately, the progress to date has largely been incremental because we don't have complete knowledge and, and it's gonna take some time. Um, this uh, eye chart is just to show you how complex the problems are. There's a lot of interconnectivity that if you tweak and turn one knob, you mess up something else. And so um, this will be a good area for people to work on for I think uh, uh, many years to come. All right, and so um, let me just wrap up uh, by saying there's a lot of exciting possibilities with the technologies that are being developed today as far as future benefits for patients. And I think it's gonna require a lot of collaboration for engineers, scientists, clinicians, and patients. So if you're interested in collaborating, I'm always interested in entertaining conversations. And then I think we are completely out of time. So sorry for the uh, technical challenges earlier, but I have to acknowledge the funding agents, all the different students. Um, this Zoom capture here shows both current and uh, past graduates, um, some of which I showed earlier. Um, and then let me, I guess I'll turn it back to, um, for questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Ellis, for sharing your work with us. Hey everyone, I'm Peter Hung, the media past chair of the Caltech Y, and it's my pleasure to moderate our Q&A session today. Many of you have already typed in your questions into the chat. And so as we go through them, if you have any other questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. So Ellis, um, we have a question from Tad. Do we know enough about the long-term memories, um, how they're stored and, um, and to use microelectrodes to measure and perhaps reduce memory loss? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, my, my colleague actually is probably in the best uh, position to answer that. So the, they've been working on this problem for years. And maybe, um, maybe the way I'll talk about it is this. Um, using just those simple uh, microwire electrodes that I showed you earlier, they were able to successfully demonstrate that it's possible to use this neuro um, prosthetic approach to be able to help with memory in rodents. And then they actually later took this um, into monkeys as well. Um, you know, the area that they work on is still, there's still a lot of science to be uncovered. And so I, I think that it's very early on as far as being ready to be a, you know, a clinical option. Um, but we'll see, I think, you know, the next uh, couple, it, it, it's going to take some time. I, I don't know, you know, the exact time it may take a decade, it may take more. It's, it's very difficult to say, but this is, I think one of the more ambitious things that, that is being done in the field of uh, neural prosthetics. Well, as I think uh, being ambitious is good, right? That's exactly what's gonna drive us toward all of these new discoveries. So um, Donna has a question. What polymer do you use to create your arrays? You, you, you were talking about the materials you're using. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really have too much time to talk about this. We use something called Paraline C. And this is actually a trick that I learned while studying with YC Tai uh, that I learned in, in his lab. I was lucky to be there at the very beginning of bringing that material up. Um, that material is interesting because it ha really has a long history of use in FDA approved implantable devices. And so it's a very convenient material uh, to pick. Um, it's not that well known because it is specialized, requires a special tool to be able to put it down. And so it's not used by as many groups for that reason. Um, but you know, it's sort of one of my favorite materials to work with. Excellent, yeah. Um, so Tadden has, has another question. Um, can you avoid mechanical stiffness damage by recording from within nearby blood vessels instead of within the, the brain tissue itself? Um, let's see, so can I record from blood vessels? Is that yeah, so like instead of being in the, you know, in the yeah, further that away. is a very interesting question. And in fact, I have a project that we're working on that is exactly that. We're at the very earliest stages of that. So I don't really have anything to report, but I do have funding in that area. <laughs> Excellent. Good question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad our audience is thinking along the same lines. And uh, who knows, maybe we can uh, get some collaboration in the future. Um, so there's another question. Have you tried these paraline-based electrodes for the stimulation purposes? Um, so 
what would the, be the uh, key differences between recording and stimulation? Yeah, so this is also um, an area that we are working on. Um, one of the key differences is that the electrodes that we use for recording don't really have the right electrochemical properties for stimulation. We really need to do um, some treatment on them. Um, there are different strategies and we're looking at which one is gonna be the best. These thin film electrodes that we work with are about 200 nanometers or so, so thick. Um, have all sorts of issues. And so um, as far as like um, st for stimulation, in the sense that the signals you use for stimulation are actually really rough on the electrode. So, so another reason they want to actually treat the electrodes uh, by increasing the surface area, you typically plate material or electro deposit material on top. Um, it's to sort of protect them and also actually um, be able to generate the right properties to do the stimulation, to be able to inject the right amount of charge to actually get the tissue without, without cooking it. You know, there's, so, there's some safety um, concerns as well. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, so we have a question from Nicholas about the long-term biocompatibility of these sensors. And you mentioned earlier that they last for about a couple of months. Um, so his follow-up question is, can you use more sensitive sensors to externally mount the sensors? More sensitive sensors to mount them. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what is meant by that. Um, I can comment maybe on the first part, which is their longevity. Um, one thing that we're noticing, I think other groups as well, is that the softer electrodes tend to uh, allow us to record for much longer, right? So it tends to actually generate less of an immune response, um, less scarring, less irritation uh, measured by you know, different methods uh, at that interface. And so at least on that level, we're okay. I'm not sure what we, what, what's meant by mount on the surface. Um, it, maybe, maybe Tad's talking about the fact that the electrodes are a little bit recessed. That recess is only about mm, 10 microns thick. So each one of our installation layers is 10 microns. So it's not a whole lot. Um, it may play a role. And there are different groups that have looked at pushing the electrodes to the surface if that's what's meant. So hopefully I kind of address that <laughs> question. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Um, so we have another question looking a little bit, you know, further into the future. Um, you know, does your research have any implication for controlling essential tremors in humans? And if so, you know, can you describe what they might be? Yeah, so th this is where the stimulation comes um, into play and also a little bit of recording. Actually, my collaborator, um, Dong Song, does work on, uh, touch upon those areas. Essential tremor is not something that I look at. Um, directly. So the way, the way my lab is structured is we build devices for a whole number of different people and we rely heavily on the collaborators that have clinical populations or animal models for testing different things out. And so I typically don't work directly on a disease without a strong collaborator in place. So, you know, um, so I, I don't have anything specific to say on essential trauma. I see. All right, we'll go with one more question. Um, so what would the neural interface and neural uh, prosthetics look like in 50 years? Oh, that's a, a very good question. So um, I would say, you know, a lot, we might be able to look at the past. You know, one way to dissect this is to, to look at the past. You know, progress in medical devices tends to be pretty slow because you have uh, the regulatory agencies that actually play a big role in, in progress. And it's so difficult to get that initial approval um, you know, we're typically not willing to change uh, very much. If you look at the devices that are approved today, a lot of them resemble pacemakers because a lot of them derive from pacemakers, right? Uh, in terms of uh, the way they're, they're made, the electrodes look the same, the packages look the same, et cetera. I'm hoping that we'll move beyond that and address some of the problems experienced in the past. And we will have the ability to have devices that not only stimulate most of the clinical devices out there for stimulation, but also practical clinical devices that record there are investigational devices and maybe a few devices that have you know, been approved with some recording capability, but not nearly as much there. So um, they'll be smaller, hopefully. Um, maybe someone will solve the power issue. They can be power hungry a bit. Um, there's been a lot of talk about wireless. I don't know that we're really there yet to, to, to come up with things that are completely fully wireless. Um, but I imagine we're gonna have some remnants of the past simply because of the regulatory process. I don't know that that's gonna change anytime soon. Um, but yeah, 
hopefully new things as well in 50 years. 50 years is a lot of time, right? So, so hopefully we'll overcome some of that regulatory inertia. Yeah, definitely. And especially with the uh, regulatory stuff, right? I mean, as there's new technology, they may have to develop a new process so that we can really leverage the new technology in a timely manner. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today's event. Ellis, thank you again for sharing your research uh, on the study of the brain with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I also want to take this opportunity to thank SEFCU, the Caltech Employee Federal Credit Union, TIAA, and Enterprise Holdings for sponsoring our event today. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. To participate in other similar events in the future, sign up for the Caltech Y newsletter and become a friend today. Until then, take care and stay safe.